Mick Taylor was from Welling Garden City. Um, he, he was eight years old um, when his, his parents and an uncle took him to see Bill Haley and the Comets at Golders Green Empire. And that had a most profound impact. Shortly after that, he, he begged for a guitar as a birthday present, and he actually took up playing seriously at the age of 10. At school, he, he joined a group um, which, which sort of played shadows style instrumentals, complete with all the sort of fancy footwork and all that sort of thing. But um, at about the age of sort of 14, he, he began to sort of gravitate more towards the blues. People like um, Buddy Guy, B.B. King, um, T-Bone Walker, all the sort of classic um, sort of blues guitarists. And at the age of 16, he actually moved to London with that intention. Um, prior to that, he'd been in a group called the Juniors, and um, after a lot of sort of messing about, they eventually got a, a one-shot recording deal on Columbia, which was an EMI subsidiary, and they did a song called There's a Pretty Girl, which was pretty far removed from the blues, but it nevertheless got them a spot on a children's ITV program called Five O'Clock Club. But that was the sort of fullest extent of the promotion, and as a result, there's a pretty girl died a death, and so did the juniors. Mick, you know, became so sort of disillusioned with this that he went back to, his, to live with his parents in Welling Garden City. Um, at that point, he joined a group called the Gods, and they got involved in some very, very silly publicity stunts, which included um, sort of going to Piccadilly Circus dressed in sheets and playing harps, you know to try and stress their sort of, you know, heavenly origins, I suppose. But he, he wasn't a god for very long. His final days with the gods actually encompassed his first stint with, with John Mayall's Blues Breakers, because he went to a, a club called The Hop in Welling Garden City, where, you know, John Mayall was appearing, um, simply because it, he was a fan of Eric Clapton. There was a time when uh, Eric Clapton was in the Blues Breakers, so that would put it about 1965 or somewhere around then. And uh, Eric was uh, quite often very unreliable and wouldn't show up to, to, to join us at uh, Waterloo Station to get on the gig bus, or the gig van you might call it. Um, and uh, so we had to go without him to uh, a show that we did in, I think it was, near Welling Garden City, uh, and uh, so we, we were prepared to go on as a trio. And uh, we, we played a two-set thing, and during the interval, this young lad comes up to me and, and says that he played guitar, and could he sit in with the band? And well, I said, well, I don't know about that, because uh, we've got quite a, quite a, a catalogue of stuff that we do that uh, a little bit off the wall. And he says, don't worry, I've seen you several times at the Flamingo, so uh, I, I thought, well, there's nothing to lose, really, you know. I've only got one more hour to do. And Eric, not having shown up, uh, Eric's guitar was available. So Mick just put it on, and uh, he played all the, the numbers that we did. So he, he definitely knew everything. So I thought, well, this is a good find. I must uh, keep t keep in touch with him. But uh, by the time we came to the end of the show, uh, he disappeared back into the crowd, and we never saw him again for another year or two. And uh, the next time uh, that we uh, that he materialised was after Peter Green left, and uh, I put in an advert in the Melody Maker for blues guitarists, and uh, we were going to be holding auditions. But on the second day, uh, Mick showed up, so that was. That was pretty amazing. So we found him, and uh, of course the, the audition ceased at that point because there was no point in looking any further. It's very difficult to say um, the, the differences between guitar players and what they brought to the table, other than uh, Eric and Peter Green uh, all had their own individuality that they brought to the to the band, and in the same way, I think Mick. Uh, definitely had his own thing. Uh, indeed, he was able to cover all the songs that we were doing, and we were all constantly adding things anyway. So, um, 
in the course of his first uh, appearances, you know, we 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 chopped the set around and brought different songs to to the catalogue, and um, you know, he had his own he had his own style, and uh, it was it, it was it set he set himself apart from from Peter and Eric, and um, I think he was probably one of the factors was that Mick. Uh, was very very keen on uh, jazz guitar players, people like Grant Green, uh, for instance. So he brought that sort of a jazz element to it that the other two uh, didn't have at all. So that that probably was the thing that, that set him apart, and and it kind of altered the course of uh, the Blues Breakers at that time. But he was a you know very very talented, and um, a, it was a good fit. And uh, the people uh, really uh, took to him quite well.